Hello, and welcome to Distillations, extracts from the past, present, and future of chemistry. I'm Mayor Rindy. I hope your stomach's empty, because on today's show, we're talking about gross foods. We realize that a lot of cheeses have the same bacteria and the same chemical compounds as body odor. So a lot of the similarities of like that you can have cheesy armpit smell is actually because cheese and armpits are very similar chemically and biologically in, in a lot of interesting ways. Body cheese and the psychology of disgust. That's coming up on today's episode of Distillations. At the most basic level, the recipe for cheese is milk plus heat plus time. But that leaves out some of the most interesting and crucial ingredients, including bacteria, mold, and enzymes, living things that combine to make an infinite variety of tastes, textures, and smells. Rank, funky cheeses crawling with these cultures are generally considered a delicacy, though many people can barely choke back anything more complex than a brie. But wait, it gets funkier. There's a biologist who creates one-of-a-kind cheeses using the microscopic organisms that feed on your sweatiest body parts. Lindsay Patterson has the story. If you were walking down East 6th Street during the last South by Southwest Music Festival in Austin, Texas, you might have been surprised to find a makeshift laboratory right in the middle of the action. A group of biologists with beers in hand had a few hundred Q-tips and boxes of sterile tubes ready to collect bacteria from festival goers. Christina Agapakis is a biologist at UCLA and the event's mastermind. She called the event South by South Swab. We've got a bunch of Q-tips here. We're getting ready to swab. So what area would you recommend? Armpits are good. Mouth, maybe. Toes. Curious volunteers were instructed to swab the dirtiest parts of their skin. Really, really dig in there when you do it. Like really rub it around there. And then the biologists swirled it around in a little tube of Luria broth. That's a common growing medium for bacteria. Christina's plan was to take the samples home to L.A., where she'd sort them out, grow the bacteria in Petri dishes, and then make some cheese. That's right, human cheese cheese and armpits are very similar chemically and biologically in in a lot of interesting ways. A few years ago, Christina was set up with an odor artist named Cicel Tolas. This was for a project called Synthetic Aesthetics. The research would play off both their interests. Christina is into microbes and Cicel's favorite subject is body odor. So they decided to find out what microbes create human smells. As we started Googling these compounds and these bacteria, the only things that we were getting was Swiss cheese. And we're like, wait a minute, this isn't in armpits, this is actually Swiss cheese. Isovaleric acid is produced by the bacteria in our armpits, and it's also responsible for the main flavors in Swiss cheese. That gave them a great idea. We wanted to sort of explore, you know, what would it be like if we made our own, just with our own armpits and our own feet and our own bacteria. We bought a gallon of organic milk from the supermarket across the street from the lab uh, and just got some sterile cotton swabs and swabbed different body parts from different people and put it in the milk and sort of swirled it around for a while, left it overnight in uh, in the incubator that sort of kept things at body temperature. And then we came back the next day, not really sure what it was going to be like, what it would smell like. After they strained the curdled milk, they were left with what looked like tiny balls of fresh mozzarella. Each one represented its own microbial community. Christina's armpit cheese, Sissel's foot cheese. They were surprised to find that each cheese had a slightly different smell and texture. One had floral tones, another was described as smelling like the inside of a Turkish shop. They're still working out exactly which bacteria and chemical compounds are in the cheese, But Christina suspects that the reason for the variation is the incredible diversity of bacteria that each one of us has living on our own skin. That's why she created South by South Swab, to use human cheese as a way for people to understand the environment of their bodies. The process of making human cheese isn't actually that different, or even less gross, than making the world's most loved cheeses. (laughs) 
Uh, we start at this far end here and we have all of our fresh cheeses. So we have fresh shell. Kelly is ricotta, the manager of Antonelli's Cheese Shop in Austin. She's giving me a tour. And then we end with blue cheese. And just like you would with blue cheese, the most else, notorious of the stinky cheeses, has a crumbly texture area. and is laced with bluish greenish veins. It's a cheese that's been made the same way for centuries. I got the details from shop owner and proud cheesemonger John Antonelli. A shepherd watching his flock had his lunch of bread and cheese, left it in his caves, the bread molded over from the ambient mold in the caves, and then transferred onto the cheese, and some fool was great enough to eat it. And to this day, all the Roquefort in the world comes from the same cave in France. And so we still eat cheese out of caves, and it's amazing because it is of the essence of the place. Um, it's a wonderful flavor profile. The history of cheese is filled with stories like this one. Essentially, people taking chances on questionable dairy products. The very first cheese creation myth starts with a Bedouin riding across the desert with a sack of milk. The cow stomach he used for a sack contained rennet, a digestive enzyme and one of the main ingredients in cheese. When he got to the end of his journey, the heat of the desert, the vibrations of the ride, and the stomach that he was using curdled the milk. Since the Bedouins' accidental cheese-making trip, we've come a long way. Most cheeses these days use a bacterial starter culture. One common example is lactobacillus, which eats the sugars in the milk, creating lactic acid. That brings down the pH of the milk, acidifying it and causing the proteins in the milk to bunch up and form curds. An acid like lemon juice can also do this for some cheeses, like the Indian paneer. But starter cultures also provide flavor, and they can bring out unique features like the eyes in Swiss cheese. Rennet is added to further coagulate the milk proteins and make firmer curds. And then you can add mold, you can add bacteria. This is the gross part. The stuff we usually want to keep away from our foods is intentionally added. For blue cheese, cheesemongers pierce the forming cheese with needles and insert Penicillium roqueforti, which creates those hallmark bluish-greenish veins. In brie, they use Penicillium camemberti to create that soft white rind. A bacteria called B. linens is sometimes used to give boutique cheeses their defining features. It's what produces the really funky, stinky, sweaty feet, gym locker room kind of smells on cheese. Back at South by South Swab, Christina Agapakis is excitedly collecting Q-tips that have seen the insides of armpits, noses, and a few unmentionable areas. Fill out uh, the card and we're, we'll give you this top card and you can check back your number. Uh, Everyone who donated bacteria got a little card with a number. They would be able to check up on their body cheese sample online. It's totally gross in all the best ways. Christina ended up collecting about 70 samples. Back in the lab, she analyzed the bacteria that grew in her petri dishes and discovered Staphylococcus, another bacteria found in cheese. She hopes to find out if there's a difference between the strains found on the body and the kind that we eat. Christina also plans to make cheese from some of the samples, playing up what cheesemongers call the terroir. That's the taste you get from the essence of a place. In this case, a unique flavor profile that comes from your armpit, inside your nose, or the space between your toes. For Distillations, I'm Lindsay Patterson. You haven't had lunch, man? Huh. Oh, great, because I... I'm starving. You got something? Well, that's the right day to be starving. I get a big bowl of lunch food for us. God, that looks well, great. What's that? What's in it? Great green. Gobs of greasy, grimy, don't for guts, mutilated monkeys meat, little birdies, dirty feet. It's all mixed up with all purpose, porpoise pus. I made it just for you. Yeah, it's great green gobs. Lindsay Patterson is a freelance producer based in Austin, Texas. She actually really loves cheese, despite reporting this story. If you're interested, you can check on the progress of the human bacteria samples at bacterially. Org. If you have something to say about this or any other episode of our show, send an email to distillations at chemheritage.org. I'm Mayor Rindy. (laughs) 
So I certainly can believe that armpit cheese might actually taste good, but at least one producer at our show says just the thought of it makes her want to gag. Disgust is just this instinctual thing that we have very little control of. Turns out our bodies react this way to keep us safe. Jacqueline Boytum has more. Imagine this. A friend offers you some fudge. If it's in the familiar square shape, you gobble it up. Delicious. But suppose it's been molded to look like animal droppings. You are not putting that in your mouth. You might physically retract from the fudge or even feel a little nauseous. You have just experienced what scientists and regular folks alike call disgust. Plenty of sights, smells, and tastes can trigger disgust. Psychologists recognize nine common triggers. They include food, body products, animals, sexual behaviors, corpses, poor hygiene, and moral offenses. With that long list, it's a wonder we aren't constantly on the verge of hurling. Scientists have traditionally focused on disgust as it relates to eating and ingestion. Disgust literally means bad taste. Modern researchers say it's all about evolution. The earliest humans adopted an automatic physical rejection of harmful and bad-tasting foods. This gag reflex increased their chances of survival, especially in communities susceptible to infectious disease. As human populations settled and began farming, that physical reaction became linked to a feeling of revulsion, which happened even before the nasty-tasting food was ingested. So distaste, that physical rejection, evolved into disgust, an emotional response to something we know will be distasteful. We don't have to taste it to reject it. Here's an example. You get a bowl of soup with a fly in it. You're disgusted. You can't eat that bowl of soup even after you get rid of the fly. You just can't forget it was there and that it was, well, gross. Over thousands of years, the idea of contamination has transcended food concerns and now includes moral concerns as well. Cue the political debate. The triggers of disgust vary worldwide. For instance, practices like animal domestication and kissing are viewed differently depending on your culture. Many cultures enjoy decayed or fermented foods, like stinky cheeses or fermented soybeans, while others find these things intolerable. Still, disgust generally serves the universal purpose of keeping us safe from harmful substances or practices, even if our stomachs have to churn a little in the process. For Distillations, I'm Jacqueline Boydum. Jacqueline Boytum works in the museum at CHF. She goes all green at the thought of staph infections and mayonnaise. And that's it for this week's show. Distillations is a presentation of the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Our show is produced by Mia Lobel, Jennifer Dionisio, Ann Fredrickson, and Michal Meyer. Our theme music is composed and performed by Andrew Chalfin. Additional music provided by Music Alley and the Free Music Archive. Tell us what you think about the program, suggest ideas for future shows, or just say hello at distillations at chemheritage.org. We're not so gross. Until next time, I'm Mayor Rindy. <laughs>